It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. One way we're available to serve you is through our Team Clark Consumer Action Center, where we will answer your questions, uh, give you advice for free, as we've done since February of 1993. You can learn how to talk with a member of the Team Clark Consumer Action Center at clark.com slash CAC. As I promised, today I'm going to share my wacky idea to deal with the frozen housing market. It is bizarre, it is weird, it is freaky, but we've got to think outside the box at a problem where we're in a bind, in a box in the United States. And later, I want to talk about code share tickets. We hear so many complaints from people who end up stranded, end up paying extra money, end up with problems when they buy something bizarre called a code share ticket. And I want to tell you how it works, how it doesn't work for you. So, we've got a problem that is unprecedented in the housing market in the United States. The overwhelming percent of people with mortgages in the United States, I've seen estimates of 60 and 70 percent recently, have mortgages that are more than three points below where the market is today. And so people who would have liked to have moved on, would have liked to have taken a, a promotion, a new job, moved somewhere else for a better opportunity, they're stuck as stuck could be. Because they're in a loan that is so cheap that they can't give it up and it curtails their freedom and independence in life. You know, I've noticed an effect of this. There are a lot of people who are in homes that they have to uh, go somewhere else for opportunity. Maybe they got laid off at their job and the next opportunity was somewhere else. And they don't want to give up that home loan they have because then they would lose that opportunity because where they move, they're going to be paying 7% more or less. And where they are, they've got, let's say, 3%, 2.5%, whatever, 4%, so much lower than the market is now. So they become an involuntary landlord. And they rent out the old home to not give up that cheap mortgage. And then they've got the obligation of the old mortgage and then the much higher one on the new place, or they have to rent where they're moving because they can't afford to have the two mortgages. It is, in short, a mess. It's distorting the housing market and all the rest. And let's think how we got here. Because of the banking scandals, the world economy was on the brink of collapse. And central banks, including our Federal Reserve, used every possible imaginable tool to prevent another Great Depression around the world. And so they manipulated interest rates down, including mortgages, which the Federal Reserve normally does not have anything but indirect, indirect influence on. And they kept those rates down for a long time for borrowing of various types. Vehicle loans were crazy cheap. Home loans were crazy cheap. Everything but credit cards was crazy cheap, or payday loans. And so, as the economy recovered and gathered strength, it was really hard for central banks to wean the economies away from low rates. It took us a long time to do so. So now we have all these people who were in loans who refied, and people who bought homes who took out these ultra-cheap loans. And everybody's stuck. And then we've got all these people who'd like to buy homes, and there's no what's known as velocity in the market. So I have, again, my crazy idea. 
It would require legislation from the Congress. But my idea is so crazy, and people want solutions here, maybe somebody will think about this. So the people who are investors who have these loans, they don't like having a loan sitting there at uh, you know one in uh, one in point eight seven five percent or two and a half or three and a half or four when the marketplace is seven. So here is what I propose: almost yes. all mortgage I hear loans. It. You're killing us. Go well, ahead. I've got to set the preamble to make I sense. Know. All right. So almost all loans are uh, pretty much underwritten by the federal government through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. So what if the government said to a lender, okay, this person wants to move. At your option, if they're in that 3% loan, if they will give it up for a loan two points higher of whatever they are, at a new home, they then have the opportunity of getting a below interest market interest rate, but the lender is suddenly making a lot more on that person's borrowing than they're making on the loan right now. That's brilliant. Well, and that's, <laughs> I don't and know then it's brilliant. Yeah. It's crazy. It's not crazy. I think it's genius. But I've been thinking about how we're so stuck in the mud and so you have to get, in capitalism, and free enterprise, you've got to get people's interests aligned. The people holding these ultra-cheap loans, like as an example, you're at 1.875%. Right. You're not giving that up. No. So you're staying. But if you did want to move, mm -hmm. and whatever the circumstances you want to downsize, maybe, yeah. And they said, well, you give up your 1.875, but you take a 3.875. And then that lender who's suffering with your 1.875% payment coupon, suddenly is like, wow, I'm going to get double the interest from this person. You, on the other hand, are like, I'm paying 3.875 instead of 7 if I move, giving up the 1.875. Love it. The idea is to align the interests of the borrowers, what's good for the country, to recreate the, the normal housing market in the United States that's frozen, and create opportunity for people to buy homes because the prices of homes would moderate if there was more inventory. And the first time home buyers who right now are frozen out, they still get stuck with the market rates, but they now have more inventory and almost certainly more affordable prices on homes. Nobody's winning with these except a small number of people who can sell and don't need to go to another home. Nobody's winning from the market being frozen as it is. So I know that this is way out there, and I'd love for people in the housing finance industry, the lending industry, to start shooting holes in it, because that's how you make the idea better. But we need some original thinking. Remember, Federal Reserve and central banks around the world used original thinking to prevent another Great Depression. But then there were these carry-on effects that are now harming people in real time, in real life, here in the United States and also in other countries. So let's find a way to free up the market again that is frozen. And this is my shortcut to making it happen. I love it. We, you so do, you do we like the idea. Should we put up like a sample letter somebody can send with the idea to their representatives? Well, I think we need people to shoot holes in it. So if we could... Um, give people an opportunity to say, Clark, let me tell you, I thought you were an idiot before. Now I really know you're well, an idiot. You or, write, write into you Clark know, Stinks. this is a good idea, but if you did this or that, it would make it better. Right into Clark Stinks. Love it. That's a perfect opportunity. All right, we'll go to questions. Gary in Florida says, Clark, you bring up inflation and its impact on consumers quite a bit, and you seem frustrated as you talk about the government's efforts and role in managing inflation. You never talk about the true problem, corporate greed. Corporations are seeing their biggest profits ever as they ri raise prices again and again and blame it on inflation and their rising costs. Meanwhile, the CEOs are getting huge salary bumps. Companies are paying huge dividends to their executives and investors and exec executing Scott stock buyouts 
to make them executing stock buybacks to make them all even richer. Consumers need to understand it's not the government's fault your box of cereal costs 20% more. It's the cereal company raising prices by 20% when it costs have actually gone up 1% because they have the boogeyman, boogeyman, boogeyman called inflation that makes everyone mad even three years after the COVID supply chain issues have been resolved. What do you see as the true cause of rising prices? So uh, there's multiple things going on and companies squeezing consumers is part of it. And we've seen this with brand name products most uh, focused in consumers' minds in the supermarket where the profits of the brand name food manufacturers and processors are at record high levels and they have been running up the cost of brand name food items way beyond their internal cost increases. There's no doubt that at the producer level, uh, producers of products, manufacturers have seen increased prices. But even as many of those prices have moderated or dropped, they have not lowered prices. They have continued in many cases to raise prices. Everything you said is true, Gary. And, but it's only part of the picture. But the way you attack, particularly in the food aisle, is you buy the store brands. The price gap between the store brands and the brand name products is so large right now because the product manufacturers have been running these prices up. And so that's where you can have great impact. There are, though, many reasons and causes for inflation. The economy has been so intensely strong. And our economic growth is, I think it's double what it is for other developed countries in the world. So our economy is running hot, hot, hot. Manufacturing is booming. We have become a manufacturing powerhouse in the United States uh, because of years of effort from, uh, from different administrations going back over the last 20 years. And the United States is again a manufacturing powerhouse. And the economy is running strong on so many different levels. So there are a lot of factors going on with inflation. But remember what I said recently, and this isn't uh, like a attaboy to Costco, but they reported over the last year that their inflation rate for goods in the store was zero. No net overall price. Why? Because so much of what they sell at Costco is private label, number one, Kirkland Signature. And number two, they have a capped markup on goods in the store. And their actual cost of goods overall has been a flat zero. So other manufacturers, potentially retailers, using inflation to hide behind, that is one of the factors that's led to stubborn inflation. Micah in Florida says, I'm in the market for a new car, and my bank approved me online for a car at $17,800 at 12.99%. 13%. Am I tied to the bank's terms rate, or should I accept the dealership's terms if they're more favorable? Since I'm a teacher and won't get a check for three months, I want to delay my first payment for three months. So, Micah, um, number one, if you're a teacher, you have access to a, a almost certainly a teacher's credit union or a credit union that the school district is associated with, or if you happen to be a union member teacher through the teacher's union, you want to get a pre-approved quote for a credit union loan for autos. Credit union loans are usually one and a half to two interest rate points lower than a bank. Um, 13%, uh, uh, even in today's higher interest rate environment, that's a pretty significant interest rate. And I would also encourage you to check your credit score and see if your credit score is good. Uh, credit cards you have, you can check many of them right on their websites. You can see your up to the minute credit score on either the uh, more respected FICO score or the, um, the one, the FACO called Advantage score, but it'll still give you a clear direction. And I think shopping that is a good idea. Also, your original question, 
if a dealer offers you a better deal on a loan, and they got lots of room to do a better deal at that 13% that the bank's quoting you, take the lower rate you're offered at the dealer. Just make sure because of what you said about uh, the fact that your money comes back in three months later, that if you're planning to prepay a significant amount of that loan balance, make sure that any loan you take out has no prepayment penalty and that interest is calculated as simple interest. And please, um, it sounds like it's a used car, new to you, based on the loan amount, I'm assuming. If it is, please go read our guide to buying a used car and how to get it checked out at Clark.com before you purchase. Okay, this is from John in Idaho. I just wanted to reach out and thank you for all you do. I was not raised talking about money and how to budget or save. When my kids each turned 18, I took them to meet with our financial advisor and set up investment accounts. I gave them each $500 to open the account and they both contribute monthly. I received some money at the passing of my father and I gave each of my kids $15,000 to invest. I'm wow. doing my best to ensure my wife and I are good at retirement and we are on track. Thank you for all your sound advice. I only wish I had known about your wealth of knowledge when I was younger. Keep up the good work. And John, I, I want to express my sympathy to you at the loss of your dad. And what a great job you're doing as a dad imparting financial wisdom. The only annex I would add, you got 18-year-olds. I assume they're working part-time, uh, full-time, whatever. Roth IRAs. If you can get them in the habit of doing Roth IRAs in addition or in place of putting money in investment accounts, that money then grows tax-free, builds extreme financial security for long-term, for retirement, and you spend it tax-free as well. I love it so much, and but I love most what you're teaching your kids about money, saving, living on less than what they make, and investing. Wonderful stuff. Coming straight ahead, something that will not be wonderful this summer, when people grab a bargain on a code share flight. What does that mean anyway? When you see when you're booking a flight, a four-digit flight number, almost always there will be maybe an asterisk next to it on whatever website or airline site or search engine you're looking for a fare. That four-digit flight number, not always, but usually means that that flight is a code share. Code shares are something that airline stockholders love and consumers learn to love to hate. The US government, in its wisdom, allows our full fare airlines, American United and Delta, to enter into price fixing arrangements known as code shares, where in order to squeeze out the potential for lower fare competitors, our three full fare airlines are able to enter into these alliances and in these code shares, they can sell each other's flights. So you'll have European airlines and Asian airlines, but this started originally across the Atlantic, will all be able to market each other's flights with these four-digit numbers. And so you could see a flight on Delta, American, or United, and you buy it thinking you're on American, United, or Delta. And like in United's case, you could be on Air Canada, you could be on Lufthansa, Delta is to Europe. You could be on KLM or Air France or Air Europa or whoever else. And then American has to tie in with British Airways. And they've all got these things in order to eliminate competition on these routes. And it was in the wisdom of uh, the US government, really the Congresses have passed and the administrations have passed. It was a way to prop up these high cost operations that were losing market share or all of them went through bankruptcy at least once to try to make them more financially stable. And they did so at the cost to you of competition. Well, when the Congress allowed these code shares, 
these price-fixing cartels to operate across the Atlantic and Pacific, they did not also require consumer protections. So let's say you buy a ticket on Delta, and you fly over on Delta, and you change planes in Paris, and you go somewhere on Air France, and you come back to Amsterdam on KLM, and then you take Delta back to uh, New York. So who's responsible when a flight misconnects? Who's responsible when your bags get lost? Who's responsible when you're denied boarding? So the airlines treat this as the law of the jungle and treat you like dirt. Over and over and over again, when something goes wrong with a misconnected flight, an oversold flight, or missed bags, the airlines, who you're flying on, who your ticket says you're flying on, they're all like, <laughs> not our problem. Go talk to them. You go to them. They say, not us. It's them. And this is an area that until there are laws and regulations with teeth that protect you as a consumer buying a coach share, you need to know that it may scare up a cheaper fare for you. It may get you a better connection. But it also may lead to real problems later on such as you having to buy a new one-way ticket home on somebody to get back to the United States from Asia or Europe. This is an easy problem to fix. Just needs to be some clear rules about who's on the hook when things get messed up. And right now, the airlines don't care. And I see the stories, not every week, every single week. Day. Well, Taylor in Georgia has a travel question. I'm turning the four, big 4-0 in September, and I'm giving myself the gift of a midlife crisis by taking a sabbatical from work and hiking Mount Kilimanjaro no during way. my break. Yeah. I'm in flight planning mode now and trying wow. to decide the best method to book the flights. I'm a Delta girl and want to stick with the Sky Team Alliance. Man, this is just what I was talking about. I found flights that connect through Amsterdam and Paris and love the idea of tracking on, tacking on extra nights in those cities. Should I book each leg separately or as a multi-trip booking? Would it be best to use Delta's website to book or should I use KLM or Air France to book for a better deal? Google Flights has been helpful, but is there another search option to help with the price comparison? Okay, so if you are a Delta girl, you want to you want to earn the points in Delta num numbered flights, whether you do go on KLM or Air France. Uh, you've got if you're going to do in a, a mountain hike, a Kilimanjaro climb, you've got to have check bags. I would think almost certainly because of the gear. Your greatest risk is the bag does not make it, and you do, and then there you are at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, and wouldn't it be nice if I had any of my climbing gear, and you don't have any of it, um, whatever you must have put in carry-on. Um, you know, carry-on of the size and weight you can take, and check the stuff that would be great to have, but it would not mess up your Mount Kilimanjaro experience if you didn't have it. Um, did I mention Hopper yet? No. You should check Hopper for fares in addition to Google Flights. And uh, you do limit yourself by wanting to only check fares with one of the three cartels. If you're willing to open it up and consider the, uh, the cartel that United's part of or the price-fixing cartel Americans in, that would be to your advantage to compare them all. Your question then about one, four separate tickets um, I would look at it as two separate tickets. No, yeah, with open, open jaw to them. One ticket, uh, let's say, to Amsterdam, back from Paris to the United States, or vice versa. And then a separate one from Europe down to Mount Kilimanjaro 
where you're doing, again, an open jaw. You'll get round trips on each of those because you are going to spend time at both ends in Europe. I would recommend that. But just take to heart what I said about the problems with the code shares and be aware and be wary because they do cause a lot of heartache and headache. And probably spend at least a couple of days in those European cities, yeah, which is, right? Which is which, what plan. she wants to do, but at least yeah. two or more in case there's a luggage issue there too, because if you're going to be on a two different airline. Two days is really good because you're going on two very, very long flights each way. This is from Russ in Ohio. My daughter has a phenomenal opportunity to take a trip to Spain with her high school in summer of 2025. The trip organizer offers trip cancellation insurance, but after many decades of listening to your show and now podcast, I know it's best not to purchase insurance from the organizer. InsureMyTrip.com does not appear to offer trip cancellation insurance for educational travel. So is there another option or am I stuck with the trip organizer or a roll, roll of the dice? So Russ, this is a problem that we've dealt with many times in the past is that normal trip insurance usually is not available for these uh, educational school kind of trips. And you are stuck buying usually from the trip organizer. The problem you have is if what they're selling you is not an insurance company issued policy, you're buying a trip protection plan that is not insurance, is just additional money going to the trip organizer. If the organization doing the student trips folds, your money's just as gone whether uh, you have insurance or not, you, not real insurance. You've just paid more money. So I would say if you do buy from the student trip organization, that you make sure that, the, that it is a policy underwritten by an insurance company. It will disclose that and you'll have insurance industry disclosures and they'll say things like this is this insurance is not available in the following states or works differently in these states that's how you'll know it's actual real trip insurance a credit card that i normally recommend for buying a trip may or may not protect you on one of these student organization trips because the travel will occur usually so much later than when you've paid periodic deposits and final payment for the trip. So there is a gamble involved with your money with these student trips. This is from Bruce in California. My wife and I are invited to our friend's daughter's wedding across the country in Charleston, South Carolina. The best flight deals all have connecting flights, which is fine, but it scares me that we're booked with connecting flights at Dallas, Fort Worth, Fort Worth, for example. With only one hour to our next flight, how can we be prepared to know where to go and how to get there in such a large airport with many terminals, different levels, and trains that take people to their destinations? What do we do? Thanks so much. I'm a longtime listener and catching on to your traveling enthusiasm. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. And I... I want to tell you, don't worry so much, be happy. Barring a thunderstorm hitting the Dallas-Fort Worth area or something like that, an hour is plenty of time to change planes at DFW. It is, having said that, it's a very confusing airport for a first-time traveler. Go online. If you have a printer, Bruce, print out a map of the Dallas airport terminals. And you will be able to see online at aa.com and if your flight has wi-fi that's free to access during the flight as well you'll be able to see what terminal and gate your flight's coming into dfw at and what terminal and gate your flight is leaving from going from dfw to charleston and the train system the new train system in dallas is really good and you'll be able to get, as long as you get on it, the right direction for the terminal you're going to, you'll be able to change terminals in four to six minutes. So plenty, plenty, plenty of time to go to the connecting gate. And the other thing, you're almost certainly flying American since you're changing in Dallas. American offers so many flights a day into their various destinations out of Dallas that normally on a normal day, unless you're the last flight bank of the day, 
there will be other connections they'll be able to get you on to get you to the wedding on time. And I hope that you have a wonderful time there. Charleston is a fantastic city. It will be completely different. If you've never been there, I'll tell you, it'll be completely different than what you're used to uh, living in California. I remember uh, my nephew, who lived in California at the time, got a job offer in Charleston and went to see it. And as a Californian, he just couldn't adapt to it and went back to California. Other people come uh, back east, go to Charleston, South Carolina, and they have found their home. So it'll be interesting to see how you experience it. And I hope you have an absolutely great, great day. Remember what we're devoted to, that you learn ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off.